There's a lot of myth about pottery making. You have to wet your clay, you can't use different clays, pit fire is not safe, and so on and so on. A lot of it is not true. So in this video, I will debug some of these myths and a lot more. I used to work in the music business for many years. I uh, was a music producer, I had a recording studio, and uh, I worked with various kinds of music, all kinds of music actually. And then I worked with photography, and now for the many past years I worked with online marketing and search engines and social media and so on, which is also sort of a creative business. And the funny thing is that I always found that the more creative the business is, the more conservative the artist in the business actually is. <laughs> we go back to the music business. I mean, you can go back in history and people are like, you cannot play music on electric guitars. You cannot play music on synthesizer computers. And then when, when the DJs came around, everybody was like, you cannot make music if you can't play an instrument. And yet they did make music. The same thing with uh, photography. Some photographers think you can only do good photography when you're using real film. And some people are like, you can use digital as well. And with pottery, there's like a million myths about what you should do, what you cannot do, and how you should make pottery. To me, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what comes out of it. Does it move you? Is it great? Is it beautiful? Is it useful? That's what matters. Is it a good song? Is it a beautiful pot? That's what matters, and that's what you should be focused on. When it comes to pottery, a lot of the myth comes out of the framework they were uh, and the time that they were created in. Uh, with pottery, a lot of it comes from back when, when most pottery was like a production potter line, pottery line. And, and yeah, I mean, if, if you do production pot, potter, pottery, then of course there are certain things that it's better to do because it makes sense um, if you want to make money from it. But a lot of us are not production potters. We do pottery for fun or we do unique art pieces and for that you can break the rules. <laughs> Maybe you should break the rules because sometimes something really interesting comes out of it. If you stick too much to the rules, you're never going to find out new ways to do things, original ways to do things. And um, well, I like to do it. And I always been, <laughs> I admit it, I always been that annoying kid that doesn't trust the teacher. It does the opposite of what he tells you. And uh, sometimes it works. I will say a, lo a lot of times the teachers are right. <laughs> when you tell you you cannot do that, they, they, a lot of times they're right. <laughs> but sometimes they're not. And I even challenge myself with things that I've said in the past and said, you cannot do that. You cannot mix it like that. And then one day I was like, well, maybe I should try it anyway. Often I fail, <laughs> I must admit that, but a few times I didn't, and something really beautiful and interesting came out of it. To help answer some of the questions in this video, I'm visiting one of my good friends and one of Denmark's finest potters, Christian Brun. Uh, he's known for his very big uh, pots that he do in his workshop in Vietnam, but also very, very fine and very delicate porcelain that is about the thinnest that I have ever seen. He also used to be a teacher on the pottery education, once we had that in Denmark, it's now closed, for 10 years. So he's a very experienced potter. So it'd be interesting to hear what he has to say about the pottery myth. I have uh, worked with the potters in uh, Denmark, in Norway, in France, in. Uh, Turkey, I've worked with potters in India and in Malaysia and Japan, in uh, Vietnam, northern Vietnam, southern Vietnam, and all potters have different techniques and they uh, a different approach to how they work. Um, and you can you can learn a lot from watching other potters uh, work because they have developed their own personal techniques and uh, that or they have like a long tradition for how to work like when I worked in India uh, they in India they have uh, like this caste system where you belong to a specific uh, group of people and 
so they they would find their wife in the other end of the country but it would still be from an that she was daughter of a ceramicist and in that way they would spread the traditions like all over India for, for the region and they would learn from each other and bring uh, new knowledge into their skill. I um, I had this potter friend and I asked him for an advice uh, how to make a plate and he gave me the best advice I ever had and I will give it to you that he said oh Christian you're a very good thrower so I think you should I think you should think about how to make the best result. And if you think about it, I'm perfectly sure that you will find out. And what he actually told me, it sounds like it was nothing, but it actually changed my life, because what he actually told me was, don't go with what other people tells you you should do in a situation, or how to do things in a specific way, because each problem needs a specific solution and you will if you start thinking about what is the problem how does the clay react how can I solve it you will find out your own ways to get around with the problems you you, uh, you meet and that is a much better advice than to, to say you have to do things this way you have to do things that way <laughs> This is, in my mind, one of the most stupid myths. And of course, it's only enforced by a few of the very geeky uh, uh, glaze mixing uh, potters. I like to mix my own glazes, but I also buy commercial glazes. I do whatever works. Uh, and I think you should do that too. The fact is that there are hundreds, thousands of great factory made pre-made glazes that you can you can buy and just mix up with water or buy them even mixed up in water and bottles ready to use and they can be great i know potters professional potters that never mix their own glazes i know potters that mix all their glazes i know a few that even invent some glazes there are very few uh, most of us just use recipes that we find maybe on glazy.org and then we mix them, maybe adjust them a little bit and some people dig more into it and study how the chemistry of glazes work and it is interesting, I, I admit that but it's not the only way to do great and original pottery some potters, professional potters I know, they never mix their own glazes they only buy commercial glazes sometimes they have a good reason, such as Christian Braun so let's hear what he has to say about it. Mixing your own glaze really has a purpose. If you want a specific uh, expression or you want something uh, like something that's real special. Uh, I make porcelain for daily day use and this and I work like real thin in the hand thrown porcelain and therefore I need a glaze that is just it just fits right to the uh, to the porcelain and the, the factory that produces the porcelain they know also how to make the glaze that is the exact match to uh, to the porcelain if it's a little too big or if it's a little too small in the in the firing it will um, it will crack a, a very thin walled uh, teacup after and i had this uh, problem i used a glaze recommended by the my supplier and after two years uh, the customers came back and there was a crack like almost the same place at all the cups and it's very difficult to um, to know that something cracks after two years daily day use but then I called up the the factory that is producing the the, the porcelain and they said this glaze we also make is has the exact uh, match to the to the, the porcelain, and after I started uh, working with the with that factory glaze, uh, I have had no problems with the with the cracking, also even after a long time. And the other thing is that it's uh, so important that you can declare that the uh, 
glass you use for daily use has no toxic and is uh, proofed for uh, for food and eating and uh, which is a little difficult to prove if you're not like a big factory and uh, has uh, money to do the tests and uh, so that's why I go with the with the simple solution of using a uh, factory glaze. When I first started out learning pottery and how to throw uh, on the wheel, I was taught to use as little water as possible, not to weaken the clay. And if you look at uh, potters like uh, Huizin Lin, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. I'm sorry for that. Uh, he used very little water. He's throwing in porcelain. In fact, he has this video where he's uh, demonstrating how little water he can actually uh, get away with using throwing a pot. But then on the other end of the scale, you have potters like Ingleton. He also do lots of great videos uh, on YouTube. I think he have about half a million followers or something. And he literally throws <laughs> buckets of water on uh, the clay. And it works out really well for him. He's a great thrower. He's a great potter. Um, he mostly used uh, stoneware. So some people will claim, well, that's because he used stoneware and that can sustain a lot more water. But then again, you have potters that use porcelain and lots of water. When I started uh, working with, or getting taught by, by Christian Braun, uh, I was so surprised to see that he used so much water throwing in porcelain. So let's hear what he has to say and why he's doing that. I work in porcelain and uh... I found out that if I work, if I want to make, like, work real thin in porcelain, I need as little friction as possible. So I use a lot of water on my porcelain, but I work real. I try to work real fast, so that I spend maybe sixty seconds on a uh, on a teacup, which means that the the clay itself doesn't uh, soak from the water, but. Uh, now I've made the same teacup for years and years and years, which means that I know, ex or I don't know, but my fingers know exactly what to do. And uh, therefore I can work real fast and the, the water doesn't soak the porcelain. And uh, if I don't use a lot of water, the, the porcelain kind of get uh, warped and torn and it doesn't like to be mistreated and be um, stressed by working with too little water. That's my experience, but I've seen porcelain potters throw almost without water and I don't know how they do it. <laughs> this myth, I had big discussions with people online about this, um, but basically there are three ways that you can measure um, the consistency of, of your glaze, how much dry materials versus uh, water you have in it. Uh, I think the most common way is to use a hydrometer. This is a hydrometer. It's got a heavy part down here, and then you put it in your pot, and you can measure um, how thick it is. There's some limitations and, and, uh, and some problems using this method, not least that you break them all the time. Um, I prefer to use specific gravity. And some people are like, oh, that's very technical, very difficult to do, but it's not. I have this plastic tube and a, a paperweight, and that's what I need to do, specific gravity. I, I um, put up a video um, about, I was actually part of another video, but I will put a link here somewhere to how you actually can do uh, measure specific gravity. It's actually quite easy. This is probably the most accurate way. And some people argue it's the only way. But there's also a third way, and that is just have a feel for it. Some potters just put their finger in it and they can see how the glaze falls off and they know if it's well. Uh, and maybe they only work with very few glazes and they really don't have to measure it because they know how it should be. I have a few glazes that I work a lot with, which is like that. I really don't need to measure them because I've done them so many times. I know how they should be and feel. But let's hear what uh, what Christian Brown have to say because he, he when he used porcelain he only worked with one primary glaze for that, and uh, he also know how that should be. 
I think it's a problem with those um, like long glass things with the, some lid in the end that they uh, very easily break. <laughs> so you have a problem uh, if you have to test everything and you also need like quite a big volume of glaze uh, in order to test it right. And uh, it goes wrong anyway because uh, they're not always steered right. And there's so many things that can go wrong. But if you are in an industrial production um, and you have other people to glaze for you, I also use like a specific uh, gravity for, for the glazing. But when I am at my own studio where I have uh, my own glazes and I know my glaze, I just uh, put my hand into the glaze. And if it's, if it's a, a bigger thing, I need a thinner glaze. If it's a very thin wall porcelain thing, I need a thicker glaze. And I take like a few buckets of water away from the glaze before I start glazing teacups and I add some extra if I want to uh, glaze like bigger bowls like that one. Um, so I would not use the same gravity of the glaze for all items. And therefore it's the, the easy thing is to, to put my hand into it and then I can look at how it runs off my hand and uh, I can see the uh, the details of my hands will will match to like each uh, item I want to, to to place. So knowing your glaze is number one. But if you have other people to do your work, I would also recommend a scale of some kind. Some kind. <laughs> This is one of those myths that are simply not true. It really depends on what you need to do and what you need to do to your pot after you take it off your bed. I very often use these uh, wooden beds. I have some in, in DF as well. And uh, most often I don't wire them off. They, they release themselves from the bed. I've been doing a bunch of coasters, small, round, flat ones, and I want to keep them completely flat underneath. And as you probably know, if you try to, to cut off thin, small, f flat things, it's very difficult because the wire kind of goes up a little bit and then it, it's not flat anymore. So I just leave them on the bed and within a day or two, they release themselves and they're done. I'm not doing any trimming on them. On the other hand, I also do lots of, of big vases and most often I like to trim a foot. And when they release themselves from the bed, they are often too dry to actually trim. So for that, I do need to cut them off so that I can get them off the bed when they're still soft enough to uh, trim the foot. If you work with porcelain, and especially if you make very, very thin uh, buttons on porcelain, very often you don't want to wire them off because you, you're gonna make a hole in it. And, and a very good example of that is, is how uh, Christian is working with his pots because they're super thin and the buttons are very thin and he never trims them. So let's see how he deals with it. When I make uh, my porcelain thing, if I, I this is like not very thin, but quite thin, uh, large bowl. And if I would have to take it off the wheel head, it would be like totally destroyed because uh, it's it's real thin and uh, I mean I could almost move the shape only by uh, blowing so I cannot touch a porcelain thing just after I um, I've, I've made it and therefore I always work on a plaster bat you see this is my wheel head it's um, it's with the um, it's, uh, there's a layer of scrap porcelain here uh, and um, it stays on my wheel for um, maybe two, three, four weeks uh, and then it's, uh, it's used but I put a plaster bat uh, and the plaster as you can see it takes away the, uh, it soaks the water uh, and so when I when I have a plaster bed here, I can, uh, when I put the clay and I, I throw the clay, 
it looks like that and uh, the uh, the porcelain just uh, lifts off. Maybe I have one here in my cupboard. Um, I leave them for for the next day and these uh, I made uh, yesterday. It's a little too dry but or too soft but you can see I can need, I need to clean my hands. But I can just uh, carefully lift it off and there's uh, like nothing left on the on the plaster pad uh, which means that I can make the the bottom real thin and I don't have to cut um, so it, it kind of lifts off by itself This is one of those myths that I believed for a long time, that if you want to trim the foot uh, of a pot, you need to put it into a chuck. A chuck is, a, well, this is a chuck. This is a, a piece that I made to fit a certain kind of, of pot. So you put it in here and, and it kind of bends, and then you can, can trim the foot. Uh, hold on a second. Um, if you have a pot, something like this, that will, that will fit perfectly into, into this type of chalk. However, if you have the ones I showed you before uh, with a, a longer neck, uh, that won't be high enough for that. Um, so, of course, I could make different uh, chalks. I could make um, bigger ones, higher ones, or I could even have one that fit into this to extend it. Um, I don't have that right now, and I just thrown these parts yesterday, uh, so it's too late for me to create a, a chuck for that. So what I found is that you can actually also use just a regular pot, something like this. Um, something that is heavy enough, this is quite heavy, it's a stoneware, um, heavy enough to be stable on your, on your wheel, and long enough for, um, for your for your pot uh, or your vase to fit. And in this case, you can see it's perfect sized for even for this one with the long neck. And yeah, I mean, for, for, for most of, of my smaller pots and especially the ones that, that have a thin uh, top uh, where you can't balance them uh, on, on the wheel head, uh, I use this chalk. But then if you do lots of different sizes of pots, you need a lot of different chocks that, that fit all these. And, and one day I was working on a really large pot, um, I think like 60, 65 centimeter. And it was kind of a thin neck, not super thin, but still, you know, sort of thin. And um, but then I was like, maybe I should challenge myself and just turn it upside down <laughs> and, and see what happens. And it actually worked out great for me. It, it didn't tip over and I did a perfect trimming and then I, I took this little uh, video about it and um, and I posted it on, on one of the pottery forums and everybody was like, no, you cannot do that. It's very dangerous and how do you dare and you have to use a chalk. I was like, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> if it works, it works. And now I actually made a lot of these uh, large uh, uh, vases uh, with sort of different kinds of thin uh, uh, nicks and I just turn them upside down and, and it works for me. So, I mean, sometimes you're gonna challenge yourself. It could have gone terribly wrong, of course, I could have broke it, but yeah, then I learned. But it actually worked for me. This is one of the myths that I actually believed in myself for a long time. And I told everybody all the time that you cannot combine pit fire and glazing. You can even find some of my early videos, I think here on my YouTube channel where, where I say that. And that's because if you glaze first, then the, the pot will be vitrified, the clay will be vitrified and all the pores will be closed. And then when you pit fire it, the colors won't absorb. And if you glaze afterwards, the temperature will be too high, so it will burn off all the colors uh, from the, the pit fire. But then one day I was like, yeah, theoretically it's true, but let's challenge myself. So I took some pots that I didn't like so much anyway. So it was in porcelain and I glazed them on the inside and then I tried to pit fire them. And this was the, the first result. And, and as you see, it worked. It's glazed on the inside 
and it have it, it's it's sort of gray so so I didn't use too many colorants on this one but it's definitely pit fired and it's just as solid as any other pit fire it have lasted a long time now so it worked out and then in my my second uh, test I did the same thing this is glaze on the inside on the outside I used a different technique flash fire and I actually have a couple of videos um, I think I can put a link here somewhere to um, to how I did these two pots and actually there was another one that from aesthetic point of view was was great but it cracked so it, it wasn't successful but it proved to me that you can actually glaze first and pit fire later it's not without conditions because the colors does attach in a different way you need to use stronger colorants to get a, a result out of it but it's definitely possible I haven't yet tried the other way around uh, pit fire first and then do a normal glaze fire afterwards but one of my friends have done that several times he used a clear raku glaze and he put it on top of pit fire uh, pots I'm not sure I like the results so much but again it's definitely possible so once again don't believe yourself don't believe me <laughs> I probably said something in this video that turns out to be wrong later on challenge yourself challenge whatever you hear and sometimes you get really interesting results out of it <laughs>
always told that you have to wet your clay before you can throw it. Otherwise there might be air bubbles in it, the, the consistency of the clay is not good and well, all these reasons. But I also work a lot with, with really big pots and so you have to wet a lot of clay and I was like, oh, I really hate that. <laughs> so I was talking to uh, another potter um, that are throwing really big pieces. He does 10, 20 kilos or even more at once. I was like, how do you, how do you deal with all that wetting? I know he doesn't have a plug mill, so you have to do it by hand. And then he told me, well, I don't wedge. I just throw it on a wheel. I was like, what? Can you do that? I said, yeah, well, it depends on the kind of clay. And then I started testing the different uh, clays that I'm using. I'm, for example, using a lot this from George Schneider, uh, 254. It's a German clay stoneware. And I realized that it is so well compressed in the package. I don't need to, to wet it. I can take it right out, just shave it a little bit maybe, put it on the wheel and it works great. I do cone it up and down a little bit, but that's more to align the particles. There's no bubbles, there's no air bubbles, I have no problem. So I stopped wetting it, <laughs> it works great. On the other hand, I also have other kinds of stoneware that is not as compressed or well compressed. There are little air bubbles and, and uh, somehow it needs to be, be wet to, um, to get rid of that and to actually be able to throw. In the other end of the scale, I also work a lot with porcelain. And uh, the porcelain I work most with is called uh, Audrey Blackman. It's a very, very nice uh, English uh, porcelain. It can be completely translucent if you throw it very thin. It's very, very delicate, very white. But when you take it out of the package, it's 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 almost like stone. <laughs> I mean, it's it's hard, and you think, well, is it is it too old? Is it too hard? But then when you when you start, I start throwing it to the table a few times, and then I start wetting it, and it kind of awakens it. It wakes it to life <laughs> somehow, and, and and you really really need to wet it to to um, to soften it. Otherwise, you, it, it will be almost impossible to throw. And there are bubbles, air bubbles in it. So definitely you need to throw that a lot. Uh, or you need to wedge it a lot before you, you, can, you can even start throwing. So it's a myth that you always have to wedge your clay. But for some clays, it's definitely not a myth that you need to do it. There's some truth to this myth. At least if you're combining different kinds of clay with very different kind of shrinkage rates, uh, there's a risk that it will break off or just not glue together the way that it would if it was the same clay. But it is still a myth because it is possible. I mean, you can combine clays and sometimes get away with it. This is uh, one of the first examples I did myself uh, when I tested this. <laughs> the, the white one is a, is a porcelain, a German porcelain, um, and the black is, is stoneware. And as you see, it, it worked. It's not a particularly nice pot. I don't like it so much, but it shows that you could actually combine it. And if you feel, of course, you cannot feel it, but you can still feel that it's a little bit bumpy. And that, of course, is because it, it didn't shrink the same <laughs> amount. I think the stoneware is around 10% and this particular porcelain is 16 or something. So it didn't shrink as, uh, equally. So this is a little bit bumpy, but it worked. Uh, but even if it's the same clay that you use um, and just use different colors, this is an example of something I did recently in a different um, uh, porcelain. It's uh, Audrey Blackman. And I used uh, two uh, different stains, a black and a, and a, a red, uh, and I colored the clay. And when you add colors to clay, it also changes the way that it, um, it dries and shrinks in, in, in the fire. So even for this one, of course, again, it didn't break apart, but it has the same sort of bumpy feeling to it. I don't, I don't care about that. I like it. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually nice um, it, because it kind of follows the, 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 the visual impression of, of the pot. So 
I don't mind too much. I also uh, work a lot with slips. Uh, so I, I sometimes brush like in a Hakimi style, uh, 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 porcelain based, kaolin based uh, uh, slip on stoneware. And again, theoretically, it should crack off, and, and, and it does sometimes, <laughs> if I don't get the mixture right. But very often it doesn't, even though theoretically it should. So, I mean, even though, in theory, two different clays that have different trinkets should not work together, it sometimes does, and it sometimes creates really beautiful results. So, again, challenge yourself and, and try it out. So, in conclusion, unless you want to do pottery that looks exactly like everybody else, then you should experiment. You should challenge the myth. You should try and do things in different ways. You should mix and combine things that people tell you is not possible. But you have to, of course, accept that <laughs> you could fail. You will fail, maybe a lot of times. But now and then, you will come up with things that are just awesome, that nobody did before you, and that is interesting. And then you can develop it, and you can progress from that, and you can create new and interesting pottery that's going to move people, and it's going to inspire people, and it's going to surprise people like me because you did something I told you you couldn't do. Don't go with what other people tell you you should do in a situation, or how to do things in a specific way because each problem needs a specific solution and you will, if you start thinking about what is the problem, how does the clay react, how can I solve it, you will find out your own ways to get around with the problems you, you, uh, you meet and that is a much better advice than to, to say you have to do things this way, you have to do things that way. Please keep on practicing, keep on experimenting, and have great fun with pottery. And if you liked any of this and any of my other videos, please uh, subscribe and uh, like and uh, share. And if you have a comment, if you think I'm totally wrong <laughs> and all of this is just bullshit, you're welcome to say so in the comment field. I will still try and be polite. So have a great day and I uh, hope to see you soon again.